Welcome to the Adventure Travel Show podcast. I'm your host, Kit Parks. In our last episode, we went through 39 of the 69 ways that you can save money while traveling. We covered things such as general savings, ways to save on food and entertainment, on your lodging, cell phone and communication back home. And today we're going to go into more details and ways that you can save in shopping, on bank fees, and on transportation, which is a huge, often the biggest part of our budget when we travel. And also, we're going to look at things that we can save money on if we're a little bit more flexible and open-minded about the ways that we want to travel. So I've got another 30 great tips for you, plus that bonus tip that I promised you that will help you get the most bang for your buck. If you're interested in learning more ways to save money when you travel, stay tuned. And let's get started. So let's pick up where we left off last time and start with a new category. The next category is shopping and money. Let's talk about money first. Number 40, bring a debit card. If you've got to change currency, the cheapest way to do so is to use a bank ATM. It's also the safest way too. In China, they warned us that there was a lot of counterfeit bills out there but we knew if we got our money from a bank ATM that it was not counterfeit. So use your ATMs. And then sometimes too, I want to caution you, if your bank card doesn't trust an ATM, try different ones. But again, always use a bank one. I never use the ones that are just randomly about in stores and all that. I don't trust those. I only use a bank one. So I'll find a bank ATM that my card likes. And I don't know why some do and some don't. Most of the times it works, but sometimes in these smaller towns and sometimes even in a city, it won't trust certain bank ATMs and then I get rejected. So don't panic when that happens. Just keep trying different bank ATMs until you find one that it accepts. And then also I use a Charles Schwab or find a a debit card that reimburses you for any ATM fees. So once a month, whatever the ATM fees I racked up on my travels, I'll get a credit back for those. So ATMs at a bank are the cheapest way to exchange your currency. Number 41 Make sure you, if you're traveling internationally, you want to bring a credit card that has no foreign transaction fees. Those things can really add up. You do not want a fee-based one. So this is especially, and use this too, when you're booking the tour, because I got tricked once. I thought the company I was booking with was an American company, but it was Canadian. So on my tour, tours are expensive. I got zapped with a foreign transaction fee. So anytime you're traveling internationally, make sure all your transactions are with a no foreign transaction fee card. Now let's move on to shopping. Number 42, when you're buying souvenirs, forget the little trinkety gift shops. Avoid the the craft stores that the tours will try to send you to, even though I've bought some there because sometimes I like the the quality and I just don't feel like hassling on price. But if you want to get a really nice, authentic souvenir, shop like a local. Buy the stuff that they use that's something that you're also going to use and not just look at whenever possible. How about a really cool tea towel? Or some beautiful local pottery. Just shop where the locals shop. So go to their stores and find something that that a local actually uses. You can save a lot of money on your souvenirs there. And then you're going to have something that's also practical for when you get home. Or as gifts for your guests. Number 43. Bargain. I know a lot of us are uncomfortable negotiating. But in some countries it's expected. But I would caution you. If you're in a poorer country, don't try to drive the hardest bargain possible. The difference is going to mean nothing to you, but it can make a huge difference into how much that family might eat that day. So sure, haggle a little bit, have a little fun, but leave some money on the table for them, particularly in a poorer country. Now let's move on to transportation. This is a biggie. This is probably one of the most expensive things that we spend money on when we travel. Number 44, travel like a local. Sure, we've got Uber and Lyft and all these car sharing services and taxis in most places, but those costs can still add up. If you travel like a local, you're using public transportation. For example, on my trip to Boise, Idaho, I was able to take the bus from Boise Airport to downtown for a buck. So before you go, check to see what is the, what is the local transit like. I also like using local trains, especially in Europe, because they're reliable and cost effective. So before you book your lodging anywhere, you want to check to see how close it is to any kind of public transport so you're not spending a lot of money getting to and from the attractions that you're planning to see, particularly if you're not going to be in walking distance. I'm going to go back to my Airbnb in Iceland because Iceland, like I said, was just horrifically expensive for us. 
So we stayed maybe five miles outside of town, not something I wanted to walk back and forth to each day when I was going to be my feet all day downtown. But it was right off a bus route. And the bus ran regularly up until that we were out seeing the Northern Lights one night and got in at like 2 o'clock in the morning. Of course, it wasn't running then. So if you book near public transit, whether it's a metro or a bus or whatever, you can save a lot of money on transit and will use it if it's convenient for you. So number 45, like I did in Iceland, you want to pay attention to those local transit routes. That saved us a ton of money on housing so we were able to stay in the outskirts of town, but we were able to get downtown where all the action was in just a few minutes. If it didn't have that local bus stop right there with regularly scheduled buses, then that would not have been a good choice because we would have been spending too much time and or money trying to get back and forth to town. But because the public transit was right there and relatively close and only a few miles away, it saved us a ton of money. Another inexpensive way to travel is number 46, use ride sharing apps. And this is you're riding with the locals, like carpooling. So use a ride sharing app and you could save some really big money. Again, to keep it evergreen, just Google the location that you want to go to and see what the latest apps are for your destination. Number 47, we touched on this earlier, use the loyalty programs. You want to be really strategic when you use your points and mileage awards. Use them to book your most expensive flights. That's what I did when I had to go from Billings, Montana to Morocco. Really clumsy flight, right? But it's only one international flight. So for the same number of points, I was able to do that clunky flight. So that's where I try to use my points and the things that just because it's really cumbersome, that's where it racks up the, the cost. Although some airlines are now starting to do the points based on the clunkiness kind of a thing or the, the cost of the flight. So this may change in time. And when using loyalty programs, when it's appropriate, when it makes sense financially, you want to stay within the alliances of your favorite local airline. So that way, you make sure you have a better chance of using your mileage loyalty program points. I want to caution you too. You want to use your mileage awards as soon as you can because as more and more of us are traveling and there are less and less award seats available on the planes, they're making the points required to redeem them higher and higher. So the points do depreciate in value. So you want to use them as soon as you can and not hold on to them. Number 48, there's a caveat to this one, but it could be huge. You want to take advantage of credit card sign-up bonuses. I ask you, please, if you have any credit problems of paying your bills every single month on time, don't do this. And not just on time, but and in full. But if you are really good about paying every bill every month, credit card companies offer, in order to entice people to sign up for their credit card, many of them will offer some outrageously wonderful bonus points to sign up. Now there's a caveat, usually you'll have to spend $4,000 in the first three months or whatever the case may be. And a lot of times they'll waive the annual fee if there is one for the first year. Remember they're trying to hook you in and counting on you to forget about it when the annual or each year. And they hope you'll rack up the, the bills in order to get the free points and then not be able to pay it off on time without paying interest. This is definitely not a savings if you can't pay that large amount off in time so that you don't have to pay any interest payments. So do not do this unless you're able to do that, please. And they're also counting you not remembering that you've got to spend this certain amount or not being able to. But if you are able to, like I said, I have, I'm self-employed. I have a business that racks up gobs of expenses for my business. So I can get one of these cards, but then all I have to do is just pay some insurances or something like that and I can whack away at the minimum and then I make sure I pay it off right away so I don't pay any interest on it, any of the expenses. And usually the bonus points are the equivalent of a free round trip ticket, often the equivalent of an international ticket. I mean, they're huge sometimes. So I'll, I'll put links in the show notes to give you some good ideas. But also, too, if it's got an annual fee and I don't want to pay it, I make sure in my calendar that I cancel it. But also be aware that canceling a credit card can affect your credit score. So this one's a little bit tricky. It's definitely not for everybody. But for those people, such as myself, that it works for, it's great. But one other thing, too. The credit card companies are getting a little bit smarter about the fact that people are doing what I do. The term is called travel hacking. Get the card, use the points, and then cancel the card before the fee comes up. That they're starting to crack down on that a little bit. If they see you're churning cards, then you're liable to be declined, not because of bad credit or anything like that, is that they've figured out that you're travel hacking. 
So let's try something that everybody can do. Number 49, find the cheapest flight to get to the region or the continent that you're going to and then change to a regional airline. Is that if you're traveling to another continent, just use, like, go to Google Flights and then see from your destination, what's the cheapest place to get to? Right now, if I was trying to get to Europe, looking at Google Flights, it says I should either go to Dublin or Madrid. Then once I get there, I can switch to one of the, the cheap carriers like Ryanair or EasyJet or something like that, and then go from there to my final destination. But you got to watch with these little regional airlines. They stick it to you on fees, particularly baggage fees. So you want to find out all the costs as you're comparing it. But doing this technique can save you hundreds of dollars on your airfare. And also another little caveat. If you're doing different airlines, which by nature, just by this technique, you're going to. So because you bought your flights on two separate tickets, if you miss that connecting flight due to a delay on the first one, you just got screwed out of that second flight. So what I like to do, just to be on the safe side, is to take that changeover where I'm going from the major airline to the regional airline and make a little mini pit stop out of that. And that's what I'm doing on my upcoming trip to Portugal. I've got to go from Sicily to Portugal. And I saw that one of the airlines, it goes through Venice. I was like, well, shoot, I know Venice is crowded and sometimes people say it's smelly and all that right now. I said, but I've never seen it. So I'm going to spend a couple nights in Venice before I head to Portugal. And that way I know I'm going to make my connecting flight and I don't have to worry about missing it. Also, if you get travel insurance, which I encourage you to get regardless, just for all sorts of different reasons, and I refer you to the earlier episode on how to buy travel insurance, read the policy to make sure, but that should cover you as well in many cases, and it would pay for the incremental costs, your out-of-pocket costs, in order to get to your destinations. Be sure to read your policy. You don't get to read the policy until after you buy the insurance itself, but you get a grace period time, usually I think it's three days, to read the policy, make sure it's going to work for you, and during that grace period, you can cancel and get all your money back. But that could be a backup plan as well if that works for you. And if you can't stay the extra night, give yourself plenty of layover time so that way you're not stressing out over it. Don't give yourself a three-hour window on an international flight. Give yourself at least like a half a day or something like that so that way you've got a pretty darn good shot that you're going to make your connection. Allow yourself far more time than you think you could possibly need which is really one reason I do recommend just spending the night and have some fun. So I'm going to put in the show notes and learn how to buy travel insurance and also how to buy cheap flights. Another episode I did that will go more detail on different ways that you can save on your airfare. Number 50, compare the price of one-way tickets to a round-trip ticket. Usually it'll be a little bit more for two one-way tickets or the same, like half price to go each way so it doesn't make a difference. But I'm finding sometimes there is savings. So it's worth checking. So see if there's a difference or a savings. This can be really important to you if your trip, let's say you're on a tour and it ends in a different location than you started it, you might not have to return back to that first place again. You might find doing a one way to your starting point and a one way back home from your end point might save you some money. Not to mention time. Number 51, I want you to consider alternate forms of transportation altogether. Instead of taking a car to get around, how about walking, renting a bike or scooter? They've got those rentals all over the place now. You just use your app and, you, and off you go. That was great in Minneapolis. Even consider doing an entire walking holiday. I've talked about that a lot on the Active Travel Adventures podcast because I love doing them. This way, your feet are your transportation as you're exploring new cultures. I love walking holidays. And most of them are not, you know, the Bataan Death March. You're just, I won't say strolling either because you are walking a lot each day. But if you've not tried one, look into that. They're relatively inexpensive because, again, you are the transportation. And it's a great way to slow travel and really get to get a feel for a culture. So I love them. I'm looking forward to I'm getting ready to do a, a Portuguese walk next month. And I'm super excited about that. I'll be walking 150 some odd miles. I find walking holidays a very relaxing and enjoyable way to travel. Plus, it's good for your health and so much fun. But if you find you don't want to do that and you must drive, make sure you're comparing your auto rental costs. And I will mention one site, Autoslash. Autoslash compares all the different car rental companies in the destination that you're going to, looks at the deals from the emails and all that kind of thing, and gives you a quote in about 15 minutes. But if you already booked two, they, you can also track 
your destination to see if maybe you should switch to another opportunity. So anyhow, it's a, a site I would recommend checking out. It doesn't cost you anything. Why leave money on the table? And again, I like to keep my podcast content evergreen, so I try not to do apps and stuff like that because things can change. So it doesn't hurt to Google auto comparison app plus your destination and see what pops up just to make sure that's the right app for you to be using at this time. And number 53, let's say you're road tripping from home and using your own car. Make sure to get it serviced before you go so you get the best mileage. And this one's super important. I will mention this app because I can't imagine them ever going out of business. It's such a great app. It's called Gas Buddy. It's free and it'll help you find the best deals on gas while you're on the road. People have told me they've saved 10 to 20 cents a gallon off the same exit off an interstate just by going an extra half a mile or so. Number 54, another way to save on travel is to consider traveling overnight using overnight transit. This means on the train, on the bus, on the plane, you're getting a long distance that you're going to have to do anyway, but you're sleeping hopefully most of the time getting there. So unless you upgrade to better accommodations on the vehicle, you get to pretty much sleep for free and you get to save one day of your vacation because instead of traveling during the day, you're traveling when you'd be sleeping anyway. It's not for everybody, but sometimes that might make sense for you. But if you're traveling by train, number 55, you want to save on buying your train tickets. Whenever possible, buy directly from the train website to avoid paying third-party booking fees. Another way to save on travel is number 56, travel in the shoulder season. By this, I mean the cusp of the high season. Most of the times that's spring and fall, which happens to be my favorite time to travel anyway because A, the crowds are down, and B, I find the weather is usually nicer because it's not quite as hot in the summertime, not quite as cold. So anyhow, I prefer the shoulder seasons, but you tend to save money across the board. The transportation is going to be cheaper. Your airfare is going to be cheaper. The lodging is going to be cheaper. Plus, you're going to find everything less crowded. I also find the locals friendlier too because they're not so bombarded by tourists so they're a little bit more chill and a little bit more appreciative of your business. So whenever possible, try to travel in shoulder season. And tours often too offer discounts in the shoulder season as well. Number 57. This one may not be for everyone, but you might be able to make it work to your advantage. So hear me out. You want to buy the awful flight with the long layovers. Yes, I know that sounds gross. Nobody wants to take those awful flights. And that's why they're usually the cheapest. But the airline must have to reshuffle planes or whatever reason they've got this nasty flight that's got a big gaping layover in the middle of it. Who wants that, right? However, you've got a couple possibilities there. If you've got an awful layover, you can store your bags and then take a short tour of the city. If that won't work for you, then number 58, buy a lounge day pass. If you've got that really long layover, those day passes can save you a fortune, especially if you drink alcohol. In Seattle, I had a 12-hour layover, but I had a Delta credit card, which enabled me to score a $29 day pass, which meant I, I got three meals there. I had breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I had my happy hour there, and I had a lovely place to sit all day where I got a bunch of work done, so I considered it a work day for $29. In an airport, that buys you two beers. And what do you think my breakfast, lunch, and dinner would have cost at the airport? In those lounges, your food and drink is free. And they're comfortable. So if you don't qualify for an airline lounge pass, see if there's an airport hotel locally that might have a day rate. I've done that too. I forget where. New Jersey, I think, once. Where I just booked the room for a few hours just so I could take a nap and take a shower and freshen up rather than sit in the airport. So what I'm saying is... If you can save a ton of money with these ridiculous, awful flights, what are your other options? Don't discount them off the bat. See if there's some way you can work with that. And not just work with that, make it work for you. Make it pleasant. And number 59, I want you to stop overpacking. Learn to travel with carry-on only unless you've got some gear that they won't take. Like sometimes my hiking sticks and all that, I have to check something. But you can save a bunch on these extra baggage fees. And when you think of it, don't you wear the same stuff over and over again anyway? Plus, your travel carry-on is not going to miss the flight. So you always have your bags with you. 
if you're not sure, I'll have packing. I'll have my packing list links in the website because I do. I've traveled three months with a carry-on, even though it was a business trip, a rafting trip, and a trip to the Middle East where I was hiking. So talk about an odd combination of stuff, all on carry-on. So if I can do it with that, you can do it. And if you're not sh- convinced, every time you get back from a trip, make a pile of the stuff you wore and the stuff you didn't use, and then. Look at the size of the pile. The stuff you didn't use is usually the bigger pile. And then make your own curated list of the stuff that you use all the time and keep weaning it down, weaning it down. That's how I got to be able to do what I'm doing right now is because I have a list. I took it out and I just take what's on there because it's only the stuff that I use. And if it's that critical that I need it, I can always buy it wherever I go. Another category. I'm going to talk about, I'm just going to call it the flexibility category. All right. If you have flexibility in your travel, there's all sorts of ways that you can save money. So number 60, find the deal first and then choose the destination. I'm going to put several links in the show notes and website of emails that you should sign up for if you want to get alerted to screaming great deals, airfares, and you can even set up alerts from your main airport to the destinations that you want to go to and get a weekly or daily email letting you know what the current best rates are so you can follow the trends. So if you see a deal for something that appeals to you, pounce on that airfare, grab it. It might be an airfare where one of the clerks accidentally, it's supposed to be $1,150, but they ended up missing a one, so it's $150. So before they catch it, buy that $150 ticket and then figure out what you're going to do once you get there. So... You grab the great airfare deal because that's usually one of the most expensive things that you buy. And then you build your trip around that. I mean, don't go to some place you don't want to go, obviously, but there's hardly any places I don't want to go. So if I can get one of those airfares or I see a screaming deal to get me to Europe, grab it. Then once you have the ticket, then you fig- build your trip around that. And here's another great transportation tip. Number 61. Explore your transportation options. I love another app. This is another one I don't think will ever go out of business. It's such a great app. It's called Rome to Rio, and that's the numeral two. R-O-M-E, two, number two, Rio, R-I-O, like Rio Rio de Janeiro. You can use the app or use it from your computer at the romederio.com site. What I love about Rome to Rio, you can see what your transportation options are just to get an idea, because sometimes if you don't know the destination, you don't know. So if I'm trying to go one place or another, I put my starting destination, my ending destination, and the app will tell me, okay, you can take a bus, a train, a plane, a private car, and it'll give me all my options, how long it'll take, and how much it should cost on average. And sometimes you can even book the transit directly with them. So I love that. So sometimes I might not realize, because I don't know how far a certain place might be, that, oh, the bus can get me there in 20 minutes or 30 minutes. And here I'm trying to find the train, all that, whatever it is. It helps me narrow down my search and saves me a ton of time by letting me get a feel for the destination, the geography, and the transit options with two entries, start point, end point, and it figures out all the rest for you in seconds. It's a great app. Definitely get that. And it's free. We're getting near the end now. Number 62, I want you to be open to last-minute deals. And last-minute doesn't have to be like tomorrow. Tours that require upfront commitments by the tour company. Let's say they got to buy a permit to hike the Inca Trail to Machu Picchu. Or let's say they're, they've booked a cruise ship to take you to Antarctica. That means that if they don't sell the space in that slot on that trip, they've got to eat that out-of-pocket cost. So look for last-minute deals which... That can be a couple of months in advance when they want to make sure that that space is sold because a lot of people plan several months out. So if that tour company knows that most of their clients book three to four months out, now they've only got two months to go before the tour starts, they're starting to get nervous. And that's when you can snag a deal. That's how my friend Margaret on our Antarctica trip, that's how she got to go to Antarctica on sale. And she just kept watching, watching, watching how many spaces were available, how many spaces were available, and saw that it was getting down, it was on sale, and she pounced. So to do this, you've got to get on your favorite tour company's email list, like them on Facebook and Twitter, like we talked about before, so you can see the deals. That way you'll be aware of any last-minute deals and be flexible. Maybe consider you want to take your vacation in a certain month, 
And then as the month gets a little closer, you start to see what's on sale. And then determine your vacation based on what you can buy on sale. I'm going to put some other links in the show notes as well of great flight deal emails that I get. And I can get them once a week or once a month. But if you want to pounce on the air deals, you need to get a daily email on that. You want to sign up for the emails to get these alerts. You can also put alerts on your destination that will help you track the trend of the airfares to see if they're going up and going down. That kind of gives you a better idea of when to buy your airfare. And also I want to refer you back to listen to that episode on how to get cheap airfares, episode number seven. So we're getting near the end again. Okay. You also want to be number 63, flexible when you fly. Midweek is usually cheaper, not always, but usually cheaper. So who says that vacations have to start on a Monday? So look at the airfares. See what the trends are before you ask for time off. That can save you a lot of money. So you want to make sure you're you're taking advantage of the airfares. That's one of the most expensive things. So you want to get that studied up. Get an idea on that before you ask your boss for the time off. Here's one that most people don't think about for choosing your destination, and that's choosing a destination that's having a currency sale. What do I mean by that? Right now, the US dollar is pretty strong. It hasn't always been in my travel career. Sometimes it's strong, sometimes it's weak. But when it's strong compared to another country's currency, that means that country's on sale for me. So something that when my when the current when the dollar was weak might have been outrageous. I'll give you Australia an example. When I went to Australia about ten maybe it's a dozen years ago, our dollar was way weaker than the Australian dollar. So it was extremely painful to go there. Everything was just so expensive that Bill and I finally just said, just stop looking at the prices, hand over your credit card, or you're not going to enjoy the trip. However, things are flipped now because right now the dollar is strong. So I could go to Argentina and it's going to seem like everything is so cheap. Even Europe now, because the dollar is strong, is the cheapest I've ever felt. Anytime I go over there, I was like, oh my God, it's almost, it's the same. And it used to always seem so expensive for me. Or at least it's felt expensive to me in recent years or decades. But back in the 70s when I was an exchange student to Spain, I was there during a devaluation. So I got to see firsthand the difference of the strength of the dollar versus the local currency. In one day with that devaluation, I felt like I doubled my money. It was surreal. So pay attention to the currency fluctuations. If you're not sure, oh, God, kid, that's way over there. I don't care about all that junk. Just Google is fill in the blank with your currency strong right now and see what pops up. And it's a very simple search to see if your currency is strong or weak relative to other baskets of currencies in the world. So with a simple Google search, you can find out whether or not your currency is strong or weak. And without even understanding currency or anything like that, you can take advantage of the fact. So how do we take advantage? How do we use this knowledge to our gain? You see that your currency is strong that's when you want to travel internationally because you're going to get a great bang for your buck. When your currency is weak, that's when you want to be doing your domestic travel because you're not going to feel a difference because everything's going to be the same to you. So if you choose your travel destinations based on how strong or how weak your currency is, you'll feel like you've got a lot for your money regardless of which way you go. So when your currency is strong, that's when you do international travels. When your currency is weak, that's when you travel domestically. Easy peasy, right? Number 65, another way to save money is to exchange your time for your money. What I mean by that, I mean, if you like to do tours, right right now, I'm just, I'm busy. I don't want to plan a tour. I I frankly don't enjoy planning trips. I like to be like a free range traveler for the most part. And if there's certain adventure things I want to do, I don't want to figure out the logistics. It's too complicated. I don't want to figure out how I'm going to have somebody pick me up at the trailhead and drop me off here and all that. I'd rather just push the buy button with a tour company. However, they've got to make money. I don't begrudge them that. They've done all the logistical planning for me, plus made all the arrangements. But there is that profit margin of the planning that you could save if you take the time to plan it yourself. Like I said, if you and a lot of people love planning. I'm just not one of them. But if you like planning, 
then you can save a lot of money and save that window because you can figure out a lot of the stuff by yourself and hire a guide here and hire somebody to pick you up here and figure out if you can take the bus from there and how to get the train there. That can all be done. It just takes time. So you're trading your time for the money that you would be paying a company to arrange that and figure it out for you. One way to make that easier is if you sign up for my monthly newsletter that I do a combo between this, the adventure travel show, and also active travel adventures that's got destinations. And so every month, at the beginning of the month, I send you an email that has all the downloads and travel planners for whatever I covered the month before. And if you're on the list and there's something already covered, just email me and I'll send you whatever it is that you need to get. But these are free and they're, it's a one page document that has the active links you need to help you plan your trip. Some of the things you'll find on the travel planners are when's the best time to go? What kind of budget can you expect for? Who is this best for? Adults, couples, kids, friends, solo travel, etc.? Is the area safe? It'll have links to the current State Department information. It'll have a physical rating. How tough is this adventure going to be for you? When's the best time to go? Do you need any special permits? Are there any recommended tours, either self-guided or guided, of companies that I know, like, and trust? Figure out what's the best way to get there. What's the best airport with links to the airport so you can figure out what's the best way to get there, if, particularly if you have to take connections. It'll have currency links if necessary so that you can see what the exchange rate is and a translator. Put a lot of time into these travel planners and I try to put it on one simple sheet so that you have at a glance everything you pretty much need to know to figure out your trip. So if you want to plan it yourself, it's a great tool for you to do so. And like I said, I do these free for every destination that I cover on the Active Travel Adventures podcast. And so I've got a backlog of, oh gosh, now we're 60, 70 uh, destinations now. And so if you are a member of my email list, you have access to all these and they're all completely free. And remember too, that if you're like me and do not like to plan and just want to push the button, I also do have my pre-vetted tour companies that are on there, which I encourage you to use because they are affiliate links in many cases, which means that at no additional cost to you, I might earn a small commission, which helps to cover some of the light bills and web bills and all that of, of keeping the show going. So I'd appreciate that. So if you want to plan yourself, make sure you're on that newsletter list just so that you get that free information. Okay, so sign up for that. There's a link in the show notes, or you can always email me at kit at activetravadventures.com and I'll put you on the list there. So anyhow, let's get on to number 66. I want you to think about altering your mindset about what kind of trip to take. Think about changing what does a vacation mean in your head. That's, I did that when I went from, I thought trips were just, you go to a city, you see the historical sites, and then you go home. I did not even know about adventure travel until less than 10 years ago. Not every vacation has to be fancy cities or beach resorts. Like I said, adventure travel, I discovered that it changed my life. So if that's my preferred way, in fact, when I did some city tours at the end of last year, I was like, ugh, that's not doing it for me anymore. I want to see the mountains. I want to smell that fresh air. So anyhow, consider alternate kinds of trips. So here's a couple options. The walk-in holidays I talked about earlier. In walk-in holidays, you are the transportation. You are free. So depending on the country, it could be cheaper for you to go on a walk-in holiday than to stay home. Plus, like I said, that's one of my favorite holidays because I get to meet locals, I get to really slow down and see the scenery, and I still get to see all the cute little villages, eat the local food. So I love walk-in holidays, and I've covered lots of them on the Active Travel Adventures podcast. So be sure to check that out. Some of my favorite ones I've done, the West Highland Way in Scotland, the Cotswold Way in England. Uh, sometime this summer I'll be releasing my walk-in holiday on doing the El Camino, but from Portugal. And there's several, several interviews I've done with people that have done hikes in Sweden, in Norway, in Japan. So be sure to just poke around the website. Just use the search bar and you'll find all sorts of fun places to go. If you don't want to do a walk-in holiday, consider a camping or a backpacking trip. Camping is an inexpensive holiday in and of itself. Did you know that there's free places to camp? Yep, I said free. There are tons of free places to camp in the U.S. and internationally. In the U.S., lots of U.S. Forest and, and BLM, the Bureau of Land and Management, a lot of that land is free to camp on. I think they let you stay like a week. I'm going to do an episode on that and do some homework on that because that's a really great option to see some really pristine wilderness that you're not going to see a lot of people in. 
My girlfriend Linda and her husband are actually doing the RV camping that way free all over the U.S. That's their retirement. And in Europe, wild camping is often very common. For example, in Scotland, you're allowed to wild camp almost everywhere under certain conditions. I mean, they have certain rules. You just can't hang out in somebody's front yard and not everywhere. But there's lots of places that you can wild camp absolutely free. So I want you to consider camping or backpacking, if that's your kind of thing anyway, you can make a trip out of that. It doesn't have to just be in your backyard at the local state park or national park. You can do it internationally. We touched briefly on home exchange and house sitting. This gives you that opportunity to live like a local, and you get to use the local's home as your base camp. And there's lots of companies out there that can help you do a home swap where you, you pick a time and the family comes here and you go to that family's house. And again, you do the reviews and you email back and forth till you feel comfortable. But it's a really nice way to have free lodging and be in the residential area where the actual locals are living. So you're not playing tourist. You're playing pretend local. If you're not comfortable having somebody you don't know in your house, consider house sitting or pet sitting. I said, Bill and I, my late husband, we got a beautiful beach home in Costa Rica. It was my neighbor's niece's niece and her husband ran a private school in Costa Rica. So this is the principal of the school's lodging that that came with his job, but he had two dogs. And they had a summer home in upstate New York. And it was too complicated to get the two dogs to go to New York and back for a couple of months. So they wanted a home sitter, and we're just taking a walk. I was like, I'll do it. I went home and asked Bill. He said, sure, that sounds great. So off we went to Costa Rica for two months, absolutely free. So basically, we had a beautiful free house for two months just by house sitting. There's people out there that want pet sitters like I did. There's people that want plant sitters because they've got their their babies, their house plants, or their outdoor plants. They want to make sure get watered in the summertime. So there's some great resources. You usually have to pay to join the organization, but it's usually a nominal amount. And that way you can look to see if there's a good match and you email back and forth until you find one that works for you. This is not as common in the United States as it is in other parts of the world. It's really common in the UK and Australia. I mean, that's considered normal when people go away. Somebody looks after their house for them. When you join one of these organizations, you're going to see a ton of listings for the UK and Australia. So there's no reason for you to pay for lodging in those locations as long as you're willing to stay put and just do a little bit of work every day by just keeping an eye on things for the people. Sometimes that's really all they want is just somebody to just stay there so the house isn't vacant while they're gone, particularly if it's a long extended stay. I once got offered a six-month villa in France. I just couldn't go away for that long at that time. So outside of your annual membership to the organization, it's absolutely free. They get a free house sitter. I get a free house. Win-win for everybody. Okay, we're down to the last few. Number 67, get the local scoop. So for this, sometimes when you travel... You dress different, you look different, you act different, your haircut's different, your skin color's different. So people can tell you're not from around there. And not everybody is going to give you the best deal because of that. That's their chance to sometimes get a little bit of extra money. Sometimes they'll try to take advantage of you. So ask your host or local how much things should cost. Whether it's a ride to the airport, hiring a private hiking guide, You want to make sure you're not being overcharged just because you're ignorant. You can also ask them sometimes, would they call the cab for you and negotiate the rate for you? Because a lot of times you have to negotiate with the cab driver before you go. That way the driver knows that you've got a local looking out for you. This is what we did in Jordan. And also if you're not sure too, ask the locals about tipping if if you forgot to look up something beforehand. Some cultures tip, some cultures don't. Everybody enjoys a tip. However, if it's not normal, throwing away money if they're not expecting a tip. In many countries I've been to, you do not tip the cab driver. And really important, make sure you know or ask a local, what is the tipping policy in restaurants? In a lot of countries, it's added to the bill, and then maybe you throw the extra change to round up to the next euro, the next dollar, whatever the case may be. But Americans have a tipping culture when it comes to restaurants. Many countries do not. So make sure you know what the local policy is and then behave accordingly. Number 68, laundry. If you're going away for any length of time and you've got to do laundry, 
which is gross. Nobody wants to do that. Like I said, I usually do the Airbnb, but I also pack a little small zip back of laundry soap because usually that's not in the Airbnb. I've got to get that anyway. I don't want to buy a big box and I want to find a laundromat. And if you have to go to a laundromat because you didn't do the Airbnb, they stick it to you at the cost of the box of soap. So just take a small snack size zip bag and put some laundry soap in it and pack it in your suitcase. It doesn't weigh a whole lot, one less hassle. And lastly, number 69, but don't forget, I got a bonus tip for you. Number 69, consider slow travel. This can save you a ton of money. Because one of the most expensive things that we pay for tends to be the transportation, the airfares. And one thing to consider, you're spending a lot of your vacation time getting from one place to the other. You're going to be a lot less frazzled, plus you'll save a ton of money if you slow down and don't try to see an entire country or an entire region in a single trip. Why don't you stay in one place a little bit longer? Really get to know it. That's what they mean by slow travel. By immersing yourself, truly, just not bing, 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 try to see everything you can in Paris. Bing, 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 try to see everything you can in London. Pick a place and just hang out there. Take your whole vacation in one location, two locations, and really, really, really get to know it. One thing I love about slow travel is you actually get to know the locals. You'll get to know the people in the grocery store, in the coffee shop, the local merchants where you might pick up a paper or snacks or whatever the case may be. And after a few days and they recognize that you keep coming back, you actually start a bit of a relationship. And that's one of the things I find one of the greatest benefits of slow travel is you really do get to feel like a local, at least for that window of the time that you're there. When I was in Haifa, Israel, I was there for eight days, I believe, and every afternoon I would treat myself to an ice cream cone. After the first, say, three days, he would wave when I came in, and then he would stick like an extra half a scoop and then finally an extra scoop on my ice cream cone because he knew I was a regular customer, he knew I was a visitor, and he was trying to please me and let me know that he appreciated me patronizing his business. And it was fun. It was nice to be welcomed with a bright smile every time I walked through the door. The same is true even with domestic travel. I was up at a conference in Portland, Maine once, and every morning I was at an Airbnb and I didn't feel like doing the grocery things. So every morning I'd found this little deli and I would go in, get a coffee and uh, an egg sandwich. So by the end of the first couple of days, he was already starting my sandwich when he walked in because I was ordering the same thing every single day. And I just it was a nice, cool little interaction that made me feel a little bit like a local. But getting back to sticking into one spot and slow traveling. This is going to reduce your daily lodging costs too because a lot of times the longer you stay, the cheaper it goes. Particularly, I told you about the cleaning fees with Airbnb. It's the same cleaning fee if you're there one night or two weeks. So my $200 cleaning fee for the three nights was there was $67 a night. It would have amortized to $20 a night had I stayed for 10 days. Big difference. So... Consider how much you would save by slowing down. And a lot of times you can negotiate a better rate if you're staying longer. So ask. Ask the hotel. Ask the Airbnb if you're staying longer. Just because this is their posted rate, email them. Say, hey, if I stay two weeks, can you do better on the price? It never hurts to ask. Remember that. The worst they can do is say no, and most often they'll say yes. That reminds me. I'm going to tell you one more funny story. I can't remember where I heard it. I was on a podcast some guy was having issues with rejection. So he made himself, I think for a year, every day go out and ask somebody, a stranger, something ridiculous that should elicit a no response. Whether going up to a stranger, hey, could you give me a hundred bucks? Or, hey, uh, can I spend the night at your house? Just completely random, ridiculous requests that, this, that the stranger should say no to. He was trying to get himself used to being rejected so that it wouldn't bother him so much and scare him so much. But here's the thing. A lot of them said yes. So even you might be uncomfortable, just ask. And then you just be quiet and see what they say. So I got my last bonus tip for you. And and this one is not so much to save you money, but to make sure you're getting the most fulfillment from your vacation. I want you to get the best value for your money. And that is, studies have shown that when we look back on our vacations, 
How we remember them most depends on the last part of the trip. So save any of your big splurges, that fancy meal at the restaurant or going to some outrageous activity you've always wanted to do. If you save those towards the end of your trip, that's going to boost your memory and your warm feelings about your vacation when you get home and for years to come. And since we get to enjoy and relive our travels for all these years to come, make sure that all those last memories are spectacular. So that way you're maximizing your future enjoyment and you're getting the most bang for your buck for the money that you spent on your trip. I encourage you to learn more about exciting travel adventure opportunities by listening to my companion podcast, Active Travel Adventures. You can listen to that on any podcast app or by visiting the website. I hope that you have got lots of great ideas of ways that you can reduce the cost of your travel so that you can get out there and travel more or at least leave a little extra change in your pocket. If you've enjoyed this, I would appreciate you sharing it with your friends and family. The best compliment that you can give me is by sharing and letting people know about the podcast. So please share it. Share it on Facebook, share it on Instagram, share it on Pinterest, share, 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 share. I would be most grateful. Thanks again for listening. Until next time, this is Kit Parks, Adventure On. Adventure On.